My name is David Holland. I come to my studio here in Oklahoma City. I live about three minutes away from my studio, so I'm, I'm here every day pretty much except for one day a week working. A little bit of my background. I was born in Lawton, Oklahoma. I had a military base. My father was in the military, uh, in the Army. He was an artillery man. And because of that, really, our family moved probably every two to three years to a different location. And uh, on those military bases, there was always a really substantially solid uh, education. Uh, there was usually um, elementary school that I would go to or a high school or junior high. Some of those were actually on the military base, and so they were what I attended. And they usually had art, not programs, but art classes, and so I would enjoy those. But really, I kind of tipped my toe into the making of art when my father was actually teaching ROTC at the University of Idaho, and this was probably 69 or 70, something like that. So during the summer, just to entertain kids, uh, the university sometimes would have a, an art class and offer it up to the kids of the military or to the student, to the faculty uh, children. So I enrolled in an oil painting class at like uh, I was like seven or eight years old or something like that. And I really enjoyed making things a lot. I was kind of being in a military family and moving around a lot. You really there's two two different ways to kind of handle it or, or, you know, I mean, there's many ways to handle it, but you can be very gregarious and make friends quickly and easily. Uh, but I was kind of the opposite. I, I really was very quiet. And so I kept to myself and I was, you know, observant of things. So I would usually get one or two really close friends. On the military bases, uh, the art classes were really good and directional. And so it, it enabled me to keep going um, with it. Then when I, um, I was trying to figure out what to do, basically, uh, as an adult, as far as, uh, you know, my employment would go. And one of the things that I really wanted to do was I'd had some experience at uh, making stained glass. Stained glass windows was something I really enjoyed. Again, making things and using design and color and light and everything to do that uh, was really interesting. So I went to college with the purpose of getting an art degree so that I could open a stained glass business. And at the time, I was working in a stained glass studio, and I won't get into the details. They're a little gruesome, but uh, through an industrial accident, basically, I, I lost sight in my left eye. Basically, severed about 90% of the optic nerve. There is still light that goes into that eye. And because of that, the eye still follows and reads like a normal eye would. So to look at me, you wouldn't be able to tell that I couldn't see you. You know, if I if I do this, I can't see you. <laughs> if I do this, I can. So someone looking at me normally wouldn't wouldn't know that. I was going to college at the time and studying or majoring in art. And when that happened, you of course lose your three dimensional sight. So so when that happened. When that happened, it was an accident to my eye. It wasn't anything about my health. So I didn't stop going to art school. I was still in the midst of it and continued doing it. It's kind of hard to explain the difference between three-dimensional sight and two-dimensional sight unless you experience it. And anyone can do that, obviously, by putting a hand over one eye and like going through the day like that or whatever. I really had to relearn to see in a way because three-dimensional objects there, you know, there isn't that second view. So you don't see three-dimensional objects the way you used to. So you have to relearn how to see them. And some things were more difficult than others. Like if you had a whole bunch of pegs in a row in front of you and you had to put a piece of paper in between two of the pegs, when you have no depth recession, you really can't do that. You can't figure out where that paper lies in, in, the, in line with those pegs. So that was its own challenge too, because if you think about it, when you're painting on a canvas, you really have to know where your brush is going to touch that canvas. And if you can't perceive where the canvas is through three dimensions, you have to do it a different way. So the way I kind of solved that problem was if you have an overhead headlight on your right and an overhead light on your left, that each of those creates a shadow. And as that shadow of your uh, brush gets closer to the canvas, 
those two shadows converge right where your brush tip touches the canvas. So I was able to, you know, I really didn't kind of miss a beat, you know, as far as that goes, but I did really have to relearn to see. And it's kind of, like I say, it's hard to explain what that means. So after I graduated uh, college in 83, I was making art on my own, basically. I was working in a stained glass studio uh, pretty much full time, but I was doing my own art. I was kind of back then, I was into pencil drawing. I liked colored pencil, uh, like um, graphite pencil uh, as well. I liked, liked that graphic light dark dimension of painterly work and paintings and drawings. So contrast was really uh, becoming super important to me. And I've noticed in in going through, you know, dealing with the, the two-dimensional sight um, thing that I kind of like almost overcompensating in my work to make th things look very three-dimensional, even to my eye, which sees them two-dimensionally. The other kind of interesting thing about that two-dimensional, three-dimensional three quandary is that if you think about a flat plane that is, for me, like the canvas or the working surface, that's a two-dimensional surface. So that's exactly what I'm seeing when I'm looking at something. I'm not seeing three-dimensionality. I'm seeing a two-dimensional space. And when I'm making art, I'm representing it two-dimensionally. So in a way, almost that almost gives me an advantage because in some ways that third dimension doesn't interfere with that representation. I mean, it, that kind of gives you a little bit of a background into where I have gotten to where I'm at right now. You told me that you often take pictures and then paint after these pictures. Yeah. So how does that work for you? Mm -hmm. I can show you um, with this. Um, so so I, I'm a basically a sky watcher. I'm not a storm chaser like there are a lot here in Oklahoma, a lot of people, <laughs> what they want to see is a tornado on the ground. And that's not what I'm interested in at all. So in Oklahoma, though, we have the opportunity to see skies like that all the time. And what I do is I watch the weather. And for me, the ideal situation is when a, a front comes through and you have that clash of warm and cold air that makes thunderstorms. And then that passes over the city and then it starts moving. Um, usually in, in my case, it, it moves from west to east. And as it does, that, that air behind it is cooler, clear air. So when you photograph through that cool, clear air, you can really get a beautiful, accurate picture of a thunderstorm with all its detail that isn't um, obscured by the haze of warm air. Warm air contains more moisture, so it's harder to see through. So what I usually do in, in the ideal situation for me is in the late evening. So the sun is at my back, the storm is uh, at, in, in the east, and I photograph the storm as it continually develops. So I photograph that storm you know, from the beginning when I see it, all the way until a lot of times when the sun has gone down and there's no more light on it. So, so the photographs um, that I use are are individual ones like this. So, like I say, I take hundreds of pictures of a single storm, and so what I do usually is I'll go back to uh, you know I'll download those on on my computer, and then you know, see the icons. And when you're looking through the icons, you can really, there's some of them that really stand out, that really are very dynamic and they have a composition to themselves, even when they're small. And those are the ones that I look for, the ones that are really dynamic, that really capture the power of these storms. And photographs capture some of it. The things that photographs are difficult to capture are the colors that actually exist. So when I'm out looking at a storm, I try to you know, commit to memory the colors that I'm seeing and the contrast of the colors and the varieties. And so you can kind of see in this in this picture, this is a blow up of that photograph. And you can kind of see how many different colors there are. I also use um, on my computer the contrast uh, lever, if you will, and um, also the brightness. And I don't usually ever deal 
I don't ever try to manipulate the color unless I see it's like totally wrong. If I've taken a photo through a windshield of a car, then the colors are all off and I correct those. But normally I just leave the photo as is and I'll work with the brightness and the darkness. And that allows me to kind of see within the storm, if you will, because a lot of times the storms, the tops of the storms will be in full sunlight and they'll be brightly lit and will be pure white and it's so white, you can't really see the contrast of the bumps in that part of the storm. And then uh, sometimes it's so, the, the bottom part of the clouds are so dark that you can't see the dimension of how they go up under. So in other words, there's space between the ground and the sky. And a lot of times you can't see that because it's too dark. So when I put the, when I uh, use my computer, I'll take a, take a photo of a storm and use the brightness and darken it down quite a bit and print that out. And then I'll brighten it up quite a bit and print that out. So when I brighten it, then the dark parts will show up. And when I darken it, the parts that are usually bleached out, those will show up. So I'm able to take, and then I'll print out a photo as is, basically, of, of the storm photograph as I took it. So I have three references that I work from to help me manipulate the light and the dark within the entire painting so that you have a much more three-dimensional looking cloud because the top part has dimension, the bottom part has dimension, and the middle part has dimension. So that's kind of what I'm after, and that's why I do what I do. I also try to be really accurate, too. Um, I don't know if you can see in this, but there are grid lines there that I basically divide my photos into 16 quadrants uh, and use those to blow them up to a larger size from the photograph. And quite often, I'll even just print them out just on a piece of regular um, printing paper from the computer and then literally just fold the paper into those 16 quadrants and use those folded lines as my grid lines to, to bump it up to a large size. So I, I re uh, the, thing, the reason why I do that, obviously, is because I want the cloud to look like a cloud, like you're literally looking at a cloud that's developing right before your very eyes. But I like capturing them and freezing them at the most dramatic stage so that they really have this kind of emotional impact on you that I know it's kind of hard to describe that, and it's obviously a personal thing, but uh, a lot of people that see my work even though they haven't seen that exact cloud before, they relate to it and they they have seen a cloud like that before. So so the work is very relatable to people because, you know, there are clouds all over the world. You don't you don't have to be from the United States to appreciate clouds. So that's one reason I appreciate you reaching out to me. <laughs> uh, because I know you guys have similar weather. Uh, actually, you do get thunderstorms and uh, I've seen many really impressive storms from Europe in different areas uh, as the as your friends come through. Behind you, you have two paintings of the clouds. Um, let me show these to you. Um, this, this painting is, that's a composite. So usually when I take uh, photographs, the foreground is not something that I want to paint. So this storm, this entire storm is from one photograph and the entire foreground is from an, another photograph. The upper, the, the cloud is from a storm that I photographed um, probably 20 years ago or something like that. So it's a favorite of mine and I really wanted to do it big. And in this particular coloration, which I haven't done before, which is a really very natural looking coloration, the foreground, um, I did a show in Oklahoma, in northern Oklahoma, and there's some beautiful, very um, serene landscapes there. It's it's quite dry, so there's not a lot of trees, but there was this particular um, valley. Uh, it was a very flat valley, but it had this mesa right at the very end of it, which I really loved. Uh, and this was, uh, I was fortunate enough to be driving by this right at the right time, so this, this storm is depicted right as the sun is going down or close to it. And this foreground had no light on it at all, as if the sun had already gone down. And so it fit perfectly with the storm. And the coloration of the storm and of the land mass also matched. So it was kind of a perfect pairing. So I'm really proud of this particular piece. I think it really works well. So I'm working on 
this is a 36 by 48 inch piece. Um, and I'm working on a set of five of those for a show that I've got coming up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, that'll be opening in August of this year um, with another Cloudscape artist. And so we have this immense, huge, singular wall that's like two stories tall and uh, two rooms wide. And so he and I both do Cloudscapes. And in order to make this uh, show unified, what we decided to do is each do our own version of Cloudscapes, but have the horizon line be approximately five or six inches up on the, and we're, we're all, both of us are going to do five paintings the exact same size, so it'll be lined up across this really long wall, but all the horizon lines will line up in all the paintings all the way across, so it should unify the entire show. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that looks when it all gets up, but and this this piece also is another one that is for that show. So that's the second one. And it's, um, it really kind of does depict farmland here in Oklahoma uh, very well and how storms come up uh, very quickly and easily, um, you know, in the springtime. And then this painting is a, a third uh, one for that same show. And uh, I've got four so far done. The fourth one is not here. This one does depict sort of my favorite storm. In fact, this is also a storm that I've depicted many, many times and have probably been doing it for at least 15 years. But I like the way it, the shadows delineate the form of the storm. So you can really see the dimension in it. And the foreground is actually a river here in Oklahoma called the Cimarron River, which has these wonderful terracotta colored uh, sandbars and it's a river that flows from mostly rain runoff and then some springs so it's not one of those raging kind of rivers it's very slow and meandering so you get these little pockets of um, water left over from when it was flowing more heavily that uh, reflect light and so it kind of get, gets light into the foreground uh, of the picture and then let me just explain this for a second. Um, I'm also working on a, a big project for a local a local golf course. Uh, Oklahoma City is building a new golf course. Uh, they tore, tore down an old one, and they're building a, a new kind of a state-of-the-art facility. And I applied for the job of making a huge painting for this uh, facility. I'll be making a painting that's 10 feet wide and 4 feet tall, a uh, single panel on uh, aluminum composite material uh, that will go in, in that facility at the end of a really long hallway. So you'll kind of see this as you walk in the, the front door, and it'll be a panoramic piece at the end of the hallway, and the hall, and it'll sit on a, a rock-faced wall. And then uh, on either side are the paths to the different um, parts of the clubhouse. So I'm really looking forward to get getting that going. That'll be the biggest piece that I've ever done. So I'm really looking forward to it. So um, I've been doing some oil sketches for that. And I'm trying to work out the coloration that I want for the large piece, you know, before I start on the large one. Also laying out the storms. Um, I have several storms in it, and they'll be overlapping and overlaying somewhat. And then there'll be... Uh, it won't be verbatim a golf course. It'll be a landscape that looks much like a golf course. Uh, maybe a, a tee that represents where you are uh, about to tee off into the golf course. But let me show you some of those sketches that I've been doing. Um, this one is the first one that I did. Uh, hoping that you can see that. And it, I like it. I also like somewhat the uh the foreground colors of the golf course it'll be late evening and so there'll be some um sunlight patches coming through uh and then this is the second um piece that i did let's see if i can get that close for you um this i like the coloration a lot better and then uh, this is the last piece that i've done and i'm uh, scaling it up to the um, size that I need for the large piece when I get started on it. So this is going to be a really big project, and I'm thinking that it'll probably take um, uh, three, three, maybe four months uh, for me to complete that project. And it will be installed, I believe, in uh, October or November of this year. 
you are well known for um, being a very realistic painter. In the past, you have done a painting that actually people thought it was a photograph. Yeah. Uh, it, well, that was actually a pencil drawing. So I did a pencil drawing. I was going to Oklahoma City University at the time, and one of the local museums invited all the senior artists, senior art students, um, to submit uh, work uh, to see if they could get into their jury show. So I submitted two pencil drawings, and one of them was of a uh, 1890s cabin in Colorado. It was an interior, so it had a table setting. Um, salt and pepper on the um, table, a couple of chairs. It had the shadow of a spinning wheel cast across the floor with sunlight coming in the window. Um, and then that light sort of picked up different glass objects within the room. So, and I, I was obviously working from a photograph from that. And apparently the pencil drawing, you know, was larger, obviously, than a photograph. It, when it, when it was accepted into that show, put it in the photographer funny. <laughs> but, I did make it in, and I was really proud of it. I saw that you're also painting flowers, very big. Yeah, well, okay, so my other hobby, if you will, is gardening, and I have a absolutely magnificent garden in the in my backyard that's 50 feet wide and 100 feet deep. It's, it's not a vegetable garden, it's a flower garden. It's similar to a uh, cross between maybe a Japanese garden and an English cottage garden, but one of the plants that I grow is called a tree peony. It's not a herbaceous peony. It's a tree peony, which is a deciduous shrub that uh, comes out of the ground. And if you've ever seen these, they can be eight to 10 inches across and they look like satin. They're just spectacularly beautiful. And I, I have over the years accumulated, I think five different varieties of that plant. I photograph it just endlessly. So it, it blooms usually in April. So right now the buds are swelling and you can see how many blooms are on there. But when they open, they're just spectacular. So I've photographed those really, really extensively. And uh, I've always wanted to paint one, but you know, they of course last maybe four or five days and I'm a pretty slow painter, <laughs> but I really did enjoy trying to get all the nuances into a piece like that from a photograph because like I say, the petals themselves are very satin, satiny, and they get this kind of crumply crepe paper look. And when the sun hits them, they're just, they're, yeah, I don't know, it's hard to describe how beautiful they are. But I've done three 30 by 30 paintings of tree peony flowers where the blossom takes up the entire uh, canvas and then bleeds over a little bit so that the petals go outside of the frame, which really helps you kind of appreciate the size of them and the beauty uh, of the petals themselves. And oddly enough, when I was working on them, the colorations on petals, especially pale ones, are similar to clouds. The nuances of the subtleties of the color shifts in, in petals are very similar. And so it, it was really comfortable uh, for me to do that. So I really enjoyed, enjoyed that. And I, you know, I, when you, when you're an artist, you kind of have to pick a path. So several years ago, I picked the path of cloudscapes. Uh, one, because it's something I love. And obviously in Oklahoma, it's something that that's appreciated. Um, but flowers was literally my second choice. But of course, art takes time. And so concentrating on my career, as it were, in as a cloudscape artist is what I have to concentrate on. And then if I have time or have a reason to, <laughs> just for my own amusement even, um, then that's when I do uh, flowers. And I have had a little bit of success. So there is a bit of financial success, but uh, it's not what I'm known for. So, uh, you know, it's not my focus. But I really love flowers. I, and I, yeah, right now it is springtime in Oklahoma and I have crocuses and hyacinths and daffodils and quince and all sorts of things just going crazy right now. So eventually I'd like to get better at plein air painting because... You know, I'd like to capture those things that are fleeting, like, you know, the, the daffodil bloom or whatever. Uh, but I, like I say, I'm very slow artist. So I, I've started to get my feet wet with plein air painting. I make some trips to Colorado and I have a friend up there that has a cabin in, in the mountains. And I've gone up there when the aspen, um, are turning and it is that, that also is 
just a mind-bogglingly spectacular show. And so I, I go out and try to do fill in a small painting within the two hours that window that you have before the sun changes or the light shifts. But I really, really enjoy it. And I, I really plan to do more of that and hopefully eventually keep doing it to, and get better at it to where I can capture more of what I'm looking at. Now, I usually do take photographs of whatever I'm doing the plein air work so I can take it back to the studio. What I'll often do is I'll take my little plein studio painting so I you know, can work for another two weeks or so uh, after I get them back from the field, as it were. Um, and they really turn out nicely because I have the time to concentrate on the color more than anything. The colors, you know, I do, when I'm doing plein air work, I do try to capture the color that I'm seeing. It's usually either too pale, it's usually too pale. So when I look at my photographs, then I have time to study the colors there and literally do, you know, I, with my palette knife, I'll do color matching to the photograph so that I really get an accurate representation. So I'm working on plein air painting, but, uh, and eventually someday that, that might include flowers. It's kind of funny. Um, I heard this one joke that one artist told about another and he, uh, one guy was a plein air painter that literally mixes his colors on the canvas. And the other guy was a guy who mixed his colors on the palette and then put them on the canvas. And the one who, who was the one who mixed on the canvas said, well, you make two paintings, don't you? One on the palette and one on the canvas. So, and that's kind of what I do is I will mix my colors up. You know, I can spend, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes creating the six or seven different colors that I'm going to use at one session. When I first started out painting clouds, I was very, very monochromatic. I was, I was mostly painting clouds that were only blue and white or gray and white, because when you think about clouds, that's kind of the way you think about them. And after photographing them over and over and over again and painting them over and over and over again, and also having those photographs right in front of me that I could literally study. I mean, I, I look at those photographs, you know, for, 15 minutes at a time so that I can really study the subtle nuances between one section and another that are what make it look like a cloud. So the colors that I like to use, I do use white quite a bit. I've kind of found when the sun hits a cloud, if you're looking at a white cloud, there's a couple of things to know. One, as that cloud rounds out away from you, it is reflecting what's straight above it. So if there's blue sky above it, the top of that cloud is actually going to be blue as it rounds back into space. And if you know that, then you can kind of create that uh, illusion. And then as you come forward in the prismatic spectrum, basically, from that blue, it goes to pink and then yellow and then white. So if you, but super, super pale versions of those three colors. And in using those, you can create that three-dimensional look to a cloud. And that's that's kind of what I'm starting to follow now. And the other thing is that clouds are incredibly reflective. So whatever time of day they're, they're existing determines their coloration. If it's midday, then there's not a lot of red anywhere in the sky to reflect on the cloud. So the cloud is going to look blue and gray, theoretically. Um, with some purples down below. Say later in the evening, when there is red in the sunset sky, that red is actually reflected onto the cloud. And as the sun sets also, the atmosphere absorbs light. Um, so the, the closer the sun gets to the horizon, the more that light is filtered out because it's going through more atmosphere to get to you. And it filters out uh, the blue light so that, so looks red at the horizon and that red is reflected onto the cloud as well but also as it's setting you might notice that the top it can be super white and then the bottom can can be uh, super dark that's already in the shadow of the earth and that progression goes all the way from the top to the bottom almost like a rainbow with exception of greens greens don't show up much in clouds so that's that's the only exception in the color uh, that I, I rarely use greens in a cloud with a few exceptions, and here's one. Uh, this was a cloud I photographed from my balcony of my uh, the balcony of my house, and it the sky was literally green. The cloud looks yellow, uh, and so you can kind of see this yellowish and white coloration. And then as it goes into the horizon, 
uh, it pales out and gets darker over on this side. It was a really, really unusual day because there were storms all over the sky, and then occasionally there there were breaks in between those storms where sunlight would just literally stream through that one spot. And this was like the luckiest thing ever. So that this one stream of light came through and hit this storm right at the uh, time when it was coming by my house and right at the time when it was building up. So it was really starting to uh, build up. Uh, so you could see the, um, the uh, wind, you know, coming into the storm. You could see it building up. You, you could see it really, really high up in the sky. These storms get so tall. And I was able to capture the, that in, in some of these photos. But you can kind of see that uh, it's, it's literally green and yellow. I mean, there's not a lot of blue in that. Um, so clouds can be really unusual colors depending on what the light situations are. And the light is everything for a cloud. You are showing the force of nature, but there's also a spiritual dimension to it. I'm not sure if it is intentional or non-intentional, or it just is. Um, it's basically non-intentional. Uh, I think I have ultimately a, a respect for nature that supersedes what I do. Uh, I, I really don't like making stuff up uh, because I don't think I personally can make something beauty more beautiful than what nature shows it as. Storms are kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, storms can be destructive, and there are people who will, you know, I, I know people who are on the East Coast who will go inside and, you know, shelter if they see a rainstorm. In Oklahoma, if we see a rainstorm, we're probably outside watching it, you know. Uh, and so um, storms are kind of a double-edged sword in that way because they are so powerful, they can be destructive, but I prefer, but there is an absolutely beautiful side to them. There is, uh, there are times when I'm looking in a cloud, I just cannot believe what I'm seeing that is actually taking place in front of me. Um, so that respect for that natural process, that power of nature, uh, you know, I don't think I can improve on nature, so I don't try to. Uh, sometimes I'll, you know, do small manipulations, but I really do try to depict storms as a unique individual, really, almost as a portrait of, of that particular storm. Like I say, storms are a double-edged sword. Some people will like them and some people don't. Some people hopefully will just appreciate the beauty of them, and that's, that's what I uh, care to show the most. Um, rarely, if at all, or ever. So most of the time when I'm working on my pieces, I'm kind of almost imagining, so clouds like what I depict have been going on since, you know, since the earth became habitable, basically. They were there before humans, um, you know, came around and started looking at them. So they're kind of a primordial element uh, in that respect. To me, there isn't a human element to them. And so there was no reason to put a human ele element into to that aspect of them. The human element for me comes into play literally in the foreground of the piece. And that's where I make the decision whether or not to include any reference to humanity at all. Most of my pieces don't. Most of them look as if you know, they, they could be just an un, uninhabited place. Uh, I don't really often put fin fence posts in or light poles or anything like that. One, because I appreciate nature at its core without that influence. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously nature has a hard time these days because, and the opposite is true. I think probably when I want to put something of human nature in there. And often it's not a human being, but it's a building. Uh, in fact, I don't know that I've ever put a, in this current series of work, I don't think I've ever put a human being in one of the pieces. Now there are, there are parts of houses, uh, roof lines. So when one is out looking at storms, uh, usually it's from your backyard. Putting the outline of, tr of a tree line in the foreground with the ridge line of a roof of a house makes it very relatable to the viewer. And that that's why I would put something like that in. One, because when I was taking the photograph, it was actually there. And that's usually, you know, it's usually not me 
usually I, I like to use the photograph as is if I can, because it is what related to that storm, what related to that storm. In other words, if it was late at night, the tree line would be relatively dark and the storm is what you would see rather than the trees themselves, but you would see the line. And then if there was a roof line in there, then that helps relate it to the viewer so that they can kind of put themselves in my shoes, as it were, looking at that storm. That's when I usually put some something uh, from humanity in, in the picture. That, that one storm that I showed you of the green with the green background uh, and the yellow cloud was uh, photographed down my street. And so I had done a painting, a fairly large painting of that with the side of the um, house that was lit with the sun because it it really helped it helped give light to the image and it helped you understand that the light was obliquely coming from the side and hitting the cloud as well as the house so it's usually when it actually is existing in my photograph that i choose to put a uh, human you know um, something human in there you mentioned that you're working with a palette knife and also with brushes i don't paint with a palette knife uh but i mix all my paints with a palette knife of course on my palette before i apply them but i i, I only use brushes you know like 98 percent of the time uh, occasionally i'll use palette knives but on this big painting i'm getting ready to start on i was speaking with a, another artist who has done large work and he, he said well that's the best way the quickest way to put paint on the canvas is to use palette knives i usually like a chisel brush or a, or a shader is what they call them, um, brush and sometimes filbert brushes but uh, fairly soft um, most of my work is done with uh, layers of color. So I'm putting on fairly thin layers with glazing and some scrumbling and things like that to build up uh, the color that I want. You have a very special connection with nature. I find that Oklahoma has a very unique rapport with nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To be quite frank about it, it is because of, of there are two or three um, television stations here in Oklahoma City who invested early in radar uh, when storms were first trying to be understood. That was back in the 60s. And uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, there's a place called the National Weather Center. And at the National Weather Center, it, it's a six-story six building that houses, I think, 10 different governmental organizations that study storms and predict weather as well as uh, the University of Oklahoma's Meteorolo Meteorological School and Ge Geological School. And so it's, it's a scientific hub of the most current science regarding storms. Um, there are several weathercasters in Oklahoma who sort of led their stations really in the process of upgrading their radars as soon as the newest one was available. And, um, we, you know, we have been known as Tornado Alley, and so uh, I think Oklahomans are extremely conscious of the weather because of that, um, because we know that we need to be observant of it, but we also have been through enough of it to know not to be afraid of it, uh, because if you take the right precautions and know when to seek safety, then, then you can be okay. But that's a necessary thing. You have to know all those weather, weather reports. Uh, I've, I've heard people talk that like they'll be in the big, big middle of a huge thunderstorm and they turn on the television for some report about the weather and what's going on and, and there's nothing. <laughs> so in Oklahoma City, though, you, when there's storming going on, you turn on the television, there are three different channels who have storm chasers, storm watchers, that are literally out in the field watching those storms as they're progressing going through, because in a lot of respects, that's the only way that you can get the most up-to-date, accurate information to keep people safe. So there's a real commitment in Oklahoma to keeping people safe, and that has led to monetary investment. There's a local weather station that has purchased what's called a boat, uh, I think it's called a bipolar radar, so if a normal radar does a sweep like this. And so sometimes one to five minutes, well, one to three minutes, I think, for the radar to make the loop. Well, in three minutes, you can have a tornado staring down your face. So what's most important is the most accurate, up-to-date information to keep people safe. A bipolar radar sweeps both directions 
at the same time. So it's, it's always current. So that particular station, I was just watching it. We had a, a mild tornado. Well, I'm not going to say mild, but we had a little bit of a tornado event uh, about a week and a half ago. So that one station in Oklahoma City carried live. Well, actually, all we have three local stations, at least, that carry storms live. You can click on your television. You're not going to get any any television programs. You're only going to get weather, weather people telling you what's going on wherever it is going on in the state. And so this one station has what I was describing as the bipolar radar, which sweeps both ways at the same time. So you can see exactly when uh, that severe weather is going to impact your very neighborhood. So you can seek uh, shelter. So that's really unique, I think. Uh, and that, that is one aspect of Oklahoma that is really unusual and is unique. Right now, you're working, you're preparing this show on the clouds. How many pieces will you have? I'll have a total, well, I'll have five pieces that are three feet by four feet. And then I'll have, I believe, I do these little sketches, um, these little five by seven sketches. And I'll probably have about 12 of those as well in that show. Um, so the nice thing about that is the, you know, the larger paintings are obviously rather expensive. And so it's nice to have uh, a smaller uh, representation of what you do so that people can have an affordable way to collect your work. Yeah, that's just another little um, five by seven sketch. So this is how I work out really details in, in you know, at, before I make it a larger piece. And I can also, you know, take me maybe a day or two days to create a piece this size. And so I can really complete a lot of work and know which pieces I like enough to create on a large size. Uh, you know, usually for me, like a, um, these pieces, like these three feet by three foot by four foot pieces, take uh, anywhere from a month and a half to two months for me to complete. So, it, you know, it's a commitment of time. So that's why I like to do those small sketches beforehand. How do you deal with exhaust with ice cream? Well, the best way for me to deal with it is to take breaks. And I don't like doing that because when, when you get involved in a painting, you don't really like to like break away. Um, so that's kind of tough for me. Uh, I, I find that if I do a lot of really close work, my eye does get tired. And so, um, I just have to rest. Basically, that's, that's the way I handle it. But I'm, I'm usually good for two and a half hours at a session. So I usually try to do a morning session, uh, an afternoon session, and then an evening session. So I usually get at least six hours of painting in a day, sometimes more and sometimes less. But I, I try to at least do that, regardless of how much I get done. I think it's important to, you know, kind of show up and do it every day. And that really has helped me tremendously. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't always a full-time painter, but when I became a full-time painter, I could tell right away that that knowledge accumulates. Since you're doing it every day, it just becomes almost habitual or, or there's a habitual component to it that, there are certain aspects of painting you don't have to think about anymore. It's just natural. It just, you know, you just do it naturally. Or one thing about uh, painting every day that really has made a huge difference for me. Have you thought or have you tried to do sculpture, which would be more tactile? Um, no, I, I had had some ideas for sculptures. They were had nothing to do with clouds, but um, there are ideas up there. <laughs> I don't pursue them, but uh, yeah. I have a, a really, really good friend named Barbara Scott, who's a, a sculptor uh, who sculpts in wood. And so I see her challenges uh, in sculpture and uh, painting's easier. <laughs> Comparing your, your art in Oklahoma with the rest of the country, your art is quite unique. Um, you know, I see my work as very regional, actually. Because of my subject, I... You know, I, what I like to depict are thunderstorms, and someone from New York isn't going to know. I mean, you know, they're almost going to, well, they've had them. <laughs> so if they were looking at it at the right time, they would see them. But uh, it's not something that they know and recognize, really. Um, and I'm not sure they've ever thought about the beauty of them either. Um, so I wouldn't say that my work might not have an effect there, but you know, the art world is so complex and so diverse that I 
I don't really try to fit in anywhere. I just try to do what I like to do and, and that's it. Finding financial success is obviously hugely challenging for any artist. And Oklahoma has a, an art market that isn't huge and thriving. It's getting better. I don't make a huge living by any means uh, doing it. So, you know, acceptance outside of Oklahoma financially is is important to me. As far as knowing trends or, you know, knowing how I could fit in or what, that's always a really difficult question for me. And it, it does seem like my work appeals more regionally than it does nationally. Because especially the Midwest, you know, anywhere, anywhere along the planet, from North Dakota all the way to Texas, obviously, or, you know, there's a huge swath of the United States that that does see this kind of weather uh, that would appreciate the work. But on the on the coast, I'm not so sure. You know, I know they would would appreciate them somewhat uh, just for the beauty and the you know the power of the pieces. But I don't know. You know, that's that's always a quandary to me. Is uh, you know, I don't yeah, I don't try to fit in, and I don't know exactly if I would know how to. <laughs> You have done four trips around the world, or at least in Europe. Which, yes. What would you say influenced you the most? In in my touring of other um, places, you mean? Yeah. The, my, my trips to Europe had a really profound effect on me. In the United States, um, I think beauty is a second thought, really, um, in many parts of our lives um, but if you go to europe beauty is ingrained in almost everything it seems like or at least that's the foundation i mean the buildings themselves are beautiful but the the lifestyle in europe to me is much more family oriented much more um i don't know down to earth if you will um so there's that aspect of it but then that appreciation of beauty goes it seems like it goes up and down the society uh, and you value it enough that you preserve it. And that's one thing that, unfortunately, in America, we don't do. We don't preserve things. We kind of tear, tear them down and rebuild them. So that, you know, that that's one way you, my visits to Europe affected me. And just the, just the, just the history just is so deep and so rich. And studying artists throughout you know, European history has always fascinated me, um, how they find their footing, uh, the ones that become known, the ones that are unknown, uh, and why. Uh, you know, there's just so much richness and so much history to art in Europe that has been preserved that I really, really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, being in a military family also, I think, since we traveled many different places i'm sure my parents took me to museums and so that's probably where a lot of my appreciation started uh and then you know going to europe and being able to tour the museums that are over there after studying art history here in, in the states uh just um, made everything full-bodied for me you know it also made me much more it gave me more of an ability to be committed to the profession profession of art, to being artist an artist for life, and seeing all the artists in Europe that were artists for their entire life. Um, that was inspirational as well. And there are so many different ways that artists live their lives that it's easy to see that um, you you just really have to be yourself as an artist and be true to yourself. And once you are, then people see that genuineness in your work, I think. And so I think that's one reason why people are attracted to my work because I, you know, I, I don't know that I put it in there, but they see a genuineness in it and uh, I'm genuine about it. You know, it's really a passion of mine. So you have adjusted very well to all the moving around and um, mm -hmm. you seem to have had a very good relationship with your father? Uh, well, it was the quality of my parenting, I think. You know, I became a full-time artist long after I was an adult. There was never the consternation of, oh my gosh, he's going to be an artist. You know, he'll never make a living or anything like that. Because I wasn't one. I, I didn't become an artist until I was out of college for, you know, I mean, a full-time artist. I didn't I wasn't a full-time artist until 2012. You know, there wasn't that consternation that, oh my gosh, she's going down the wrong path. They could see all along that I was talented. My mom saw that I was talented from the very beginning, and she always encouraged that. My mom was the one who really, my mom had a little bit of an artistic 
um, quality uh, ability to herself. And she would also do crafts and things like that. And she was really the one who influenced me, I'd say, in the making things aspect of art. And my father was just, he was just the rock that kept the family together. Um, my dad was quiet like I am. And so, you know, we didn't have a huge uh, relationship where we talked with each other all the time. Uh, quite often, you know, two or three times he was stationed in other places for six months to two years. And so we didn't see him. And my mom just held everything together. She was amazing. She's a trooper. She is just incredible. Uh, she was raised on a farm in Kansas and had a lot of responsibility on that farm, even as a child. And so she was very organized uh, and she took just wonderful care of us kids. We didn't really, you know, I, I was one of the lucky ones, really. I had a very wonderful childhood. Um, you know, I felt loved. The, I, I'd say the only drawback to being in a military family is having to be uprooted, you know, every every two or three years. Uh, but when you're young, you adjust to that, I think, fairly well. You know, I think as a young adult, you probably wouldn't because you would develop friends that you wouldn't want to leave and you would probably do anything you could to stay in the place where you were. But as a military family, I think it was always understood that, you know, you're only in this place for so long and then, and then you you know, you'll get moved somewhere. So you do, you know, I, I, like I say, I usually would develop one really, really good friend that I could pal around with. Um, and that was enough for me. If you're quiet and you have a single friend, then you have conversations between you. And so that's kind of what I gravitated to is having a friend, you know, uh, in most of the places that I went to. But really, it was the family upbringing, I think, and the way that you know, in the military, even though you don't, you know, my dad wasn't making a, a heck of a lot of money, the families are provided for. So it was, you know, we never uh, had, uh, you know, really hard times as a family. Uh, so I think that also is one reason why I'm kind of, I don't know, how, however you would describe it. You went into stained glass. How did you choose this media? When I was in Idaho, my dad was teaching at the university there, uh, there was this really old church, uh, St. Matthew's, St. Mary's Catholic Church that we went to every Sunday. And the stained glass windows in that place were spectacular. They were so incredibly colorful. So as a young kid, I, I, you know, in church, uh, you know, I probably wasn't paying attention a lot and was looking at the windows all the time. And the artwork on the windows was the hand painted I'm sure that these were done and had to have been done in Europe. They were, they were, you know, the hand painted figures that looked real. And so I'm pretty sure that that's where I got my interest in stained glass, um, just because of the effect that it had on me and the color. It's also the, the way light goes through glass, colored glass fascinated me. And I have had the opportunity to work at a stained glass studio, uh, when we moved back to Oklahoma City. And so that, um, you know, I got good enough that I was actually teaching lessons, uh, showing people how to do it. Um, but I would make some really, so there's different kinds of, uh, stained glass to do. Uh, one is using lead, uh, channels to put the pieces of glass together. The other is called copper foil, where you wrap each piece with a copper foil and then solder that together. And that's what holds it together. So I'm a super, super detailed person. And so I would do these pieces, large stained glass pieces with probably, I don't know, 150 little bitty pieces in them. And um, I really love doing that. It's almost like, well, it's like creating art that I'm doing now. You can see how the cumulative bits of work that you do on each individual piece lead to this whole that makes this incredibly beautiful image in the end. And so, so that's, I think, where I got my interest in St. Glass was literally seeing them in that church when I was a kid. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, how to market your work, really, because I think it is one of the most important things that artists are not taught in school, unfortunately. And it is one of them. It's unfortunately nowadays with the Internet, um, artists almost have to be their own promoters. There's no one who's going to promote you like yourself. So. A lot of artists are really hesitant to do that because they're shy or because they're 
um, not confident or whatever. But one thing that I wish I had known when I was a young artist coming up was how important the people are to you. And what I mean by the people is the people that you meet along your path, your art path. So there are certain people who you meet who, uh, for instance, when I w there, there are right now, believe it or not, I'm 63 years old and there are probably four or five different individuals that I knew 25 years ago that were just kind of struggling like me who now are in heads of arts organizations. So, so those are people that I knew. So that's what I mean by people. And not, it's not just fellow artists. It's not just gallery owners. It's not just anybody. It, everyone should know that you're an artist and what you do. And you should not ever be afraid of talking to people about that. And the more you talk to people about that, the more people that you get, the more people that you get, the more people that are interested in your work, the more people will support your work, the more people that will buy your work. And when people buy your work, then that perpetuates your ability to make it. That's what I'd always wanted to do. I would always want to make enough money that I, I can continue to make more art. That's my, that's the way I want it to roll. There was, there was a, a seminar that I went to called Creative Capital that uh, in 2006 was a weekend retreat put on by the Oklahoma Visual Arts Coalition, which is an arts supportive organization here in Oklahoma City. And in that seminar, they went through every single aspect of what it took to become a professional artist. And that concept of a professional artist is extremely important if you want to make a career out of art. They, they told you all the paraphernalia that you need to be able to present yourself as a professional artist. And that really hit home with me. And it was like this light bulb went off. And, you know, it was like that gave me the ability to focus on uh, art as a career um, and know what, what things I needed to accomplish to help that happen. So in that seminar, one of the things they went over was how to connect to people and how those connections can lead you further down your path. So for instance, you might meet somebody one week and then you know, a couple of years down the road, you see that they've opened a gallery. And so you know, the logical thing is if you're looking for gallery representation and you met that person before, now you have an in and you can go uh, see that person at their gallery and, and theoretically get, you know, ask for representation or whatever. So my advice to artists is keep track of your people, the people that you meet all along your path. Nowadays, I'm not sure if email is the right most effective tool, but it, uh, Say uh, keeping that connection with the people in, in your life career. Um, so that's that's really important. And I think the um, just the self promotion aspect of it. Uh, one thing you need to be able to do is obviously talk about yourself and talk about your work and and be able to relate it to people and have people understand exactly what you do and why you do it. So those are all things that artists, as they're starting out, kind of need to figure out. And once they do. And especially if they focus on something like I focused on clouds. So I'm known for clouds, both myself as a cloud painter. And so that's important to know who you are or what, you know, if there, there comes this point when you're creating an art, I think that you do want to commit yourself to one thing or another when you, when you find what it is that you love to create. And so once you find that, then you naturally pursue that. And as you focus on that, then you become known as that. And it kind of perpetuates itself. So it is good to kind of make that decision, though, and decide what kind of an artist you want to be. Mm -hmm.